Dr. Isabel de Bruyne Cardoso and Yuri Holdmakers. Uh, they will talk about uh, From Shield to Clarity, Reframing Disability Ethics for a Safer Church. I understood that you will present together, yes. and perhaps you say some words on your background. It's perhaps easier okay, for so you than for me, <laughs> uh, because you come from the economic field, if I if I've seen that, or a school business of economics, yeah, business side, and you come from from ethics, yes. is, yeah. So the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Okay, good afternoon, uh, everyone. It's a pleasure for us both to be here. I am uh, Isabel de Bruyne. I am Yuri And we will be presenting two concepts, the NGO halo effect and Parisia. So thank you so much, Nandini, for also setting us up, talking about the halo and Foucault, on how we can potentially think about how we look at disability ethics in a different way for a safer church. And even though we mentioned safer church, because we are in the context of a church, this can also be applied to any organization that is working with children with disabilities or people with disabilities in, in general. Uh, before I begin, uh, like you asked, my, my background, uh, we are both from the Rotterdam School of Management at the Erasmus University in the Netherlands. Even though we are both from the Netherlands, we are not talking about evidence specifically generated in the Netherlands. Uh, we are both presenting our conceptual ideas and how they can be presented within the scope of disability uh, ethics. Um, since you asked for background, I have two children, uh, but no grandchildren yet. <laughs> so, uh, the age of 13 and 10. Uh, before I start talking about my part, the NGO halo effect, it would be very interesting to see with a show of hands who has reflected upon or considered whether your own good intentions can lead to bad outcomes. Very nice. Okay, also nice to see that the students who we engage with in February are still reflecting um, on that. And as part of my doctoral research, I established that link between how this perception of moral goodness can actually motivate and blind one to unethical behavior unintentionally. I look at three uh, inherent characteristics of NGOs, and I look at NGOs because this is a type of organization that is normally perceived to be good. We can consider the church, the Catholic church, but any faith-based organization also as part of this. So looking at one of the characteristics, the non-distribution constraints, this is a term that refers to that any money that is generated is put back for the purposes of the organization. So the money is not put into the purposes of someone's pocket. So if the organization is not motivated by profit, then what is it motivated by? It is motivated by mission. And this comes to show also the very central place that missions have in such good organizations. It also comes to show that the mission is not driven for money, but the mission is driven for the sake of reaching the public good. The, the mission of the organization is to reach others. It is not necessarily to benefit yourself. This is when I then conceptualize the elements of the halo. Because if there is a perception of goodness, it can also be idealized or glorified. And what does that idealization or that glorification mean? It means that it can then be prioritized over other means. It can enable an ends justifies the mentality um, way of thinking, which can lead to a sense of moral justification. In other words, if the mission is glorified, anything that you put in to meet that mission will by definition be considered good, because at the end of the day, your mission is, is idealized. Another characteristic of what makes an NGO is their privateness. So in other words, NGOs have the freedom, the autonomy to decide their mission based on what they themselves think is good. So this is different, for example, than government, which is reflective, theoretically speaking, um, of, 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 of the median voter. Um, in an NGO or in a church, are able to decide themselves what they believe is good. So there's already that very clear perception that one's own morals are good, because why would you decide to have a mission based on bad morals? You already assume them to be, to be good. Now, if you idealize your own morals, 
and you glorify your own morals, it can also lead to this tendency to think that others' morals are bad or worse. And that can lead to a sense of moral superiority where you feel that you can be licensed to trump or disregard or ignore others' morals. And these can be the law, but they can also be uh, the society or the community where, where you work in, which can lead to unethical behavior. Another characteristic of NGOs is the element of being voluntary. There is a sense of self-sacrifice. People give their time, their money, uh, their efforts without necessarily getting anything in return. That leads to the sense also that people are good. And if these people are glorified, whereby they are seen as inherently good and by extension inherently trustworthy, and some of the presenters before had been speaking about the importance of recruitment, Right? There is already this sense of, well, you are coming to us because you have the same value base, you are drawn to us as a mission, we already believe you to be good. So if there is that sense of people in the organization being inherently good, they can be prioritized over the internal ethics management within the organization. That could be like a safeguarding policy or a code of conduct. Um, I consider this concept as moral naivete, whereby people are considered to be given a second chance uh, over the implementation of a safeguarding policy. I understand this is very theoretical, so now I'm trying to apply this to how we can consider this within the frame of um, organizations working with children with disabilities or people with disabilities um, in, in general. So if we look at that element of moral justification, the blinding factor of ends justifies the means, that if the mission to, for example, uh, meet the needs of children with disabilities is glorified, whereby anything that you put into meeting that mission is considered to be good, it can, for example, activate, an, as an example, the unethical behavior of diverting resources from other parts of the organization, specifically for the specific group. We know that children with disabilities are not the only vulnerable group that an organization might potentially be working with. Um, another example of unethical behavior can be um, making the, the beneficiary group uh, seem to be more vulnerable to donors as a way to get more money for the organization. We see this happening um, in real life examples that came out from my research, not specifically from children with disabilities, but, um, but other NGOs. An example of mor moral superiority, and I think this comes down also to what you had said in your presentation earlier, uh, Georg, about this element of voice and choice. If we believe that children with disabilities don't have a voice, if we know what is better for them, we don't include them in decision-making processes. We decide for them on their behalf and ignoring, in essence, their needs and preferences because we believe that we know better. The sense of moral naivete is when one's own people are considered to be inherently good and deserve countless chances of redeeming themselves, being forgiven, rather than the actual safeguarding policy being implemented. Um, I've just presented you with a, with a, with a factor or, an, or uh, a, a problem, if you will, of how our perception of goodness can blind one to um, inadvertently leading to unethical behavior. This, of course, has implications for management or for leaders, because how can we see our own, ha our own halo? And how can we avoid that slippery slope of perceiving goodness to glorification and, 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 and break that's trajectory. So while I've presented an arguable problem, the halo effect of blinding us to unethical behavior, my colleague will present the solu a solution, not the, not the, a, a, there's no halo here, a solution, a, a solution um, to how we can see uh, the halo. So over to you. So, oh, I'm so sorry, the energy is back, yeah. Um, my name is Juri Udemakers, uh, and I'm also from, uh, from Holland. I'm doing research for it in, in truth-telling within organizations. So, not only truth-telling, so not only speaking up, speak, not only speaking truth to power, but speaking the plain truth to power. So, without interests, without dependency relationships, 
uh, and thereby I make a link to the ancient court jester. So in Germany it is called Hofna and in Italian it's Buffona della Corte. Sorry for the pronunciation. Um, oh, um, uh, so sorry, now it's, uh, now it's gone, the moment is gone. First a question, uh, which of you are leaders or have a, have a managerial function? Oh, that's a lot, okay. And um, how do you ensure that the plain truth is spoken to you as a leader within your organization? <laughs> Any examples? Yeah? That just happens naturally. Yeah? Oh, I like your organization already. Nice. Where do you work? Oh, in the whole Australia. Oh, nice, okay. And your example? I wasn't from Australia. Okay. <laughs> Who is not from Australia now? <laughs> okay. So, we, I think we all know the concept of um, uh, psychological safety. Yeah, I see some nodding. That is saying whatever you want uh, without consequences. But if we are looking very uh, yeah, sharp to that, consequence can be raising my eyebrow and then uh, psychological safety is gone. There is a concept, however, that is called parhesia. Are you familiar with that concept? No? Who is? Who is familiar with the concept of parhesia? Parhesia, parhesia. Nee? Could you spell it for me, I'm going to show it to you. Oh, yeah, parhesia <laughs> is uh, speaking truth with frankness and the courage to confront authority. So parhesia uh, requires a pact between the speaker and the listener, wherein both parties must have the courage to speak and to accept the truth, the plain truth. So if we dive deeper in the concept of uh, parhesia, we, we see some dimensions. The dimensions in parhesia as truth-telling, commitment, risk-bearing, and ethical guidance. And then we have some columns, so purpose and articulation. So if we are going to look at truth-telling, for example, and we see the purpose and articulation of parhesia, uh, that is to reveal the complete truth, so the complete truth without any rhetorical embellishment or deception. If we're going to look to the mechanisms and practices, then it's about saying everything, everything without hiding anything. And the range of outcomes here is full disclosure and full transparency. If we are going to look to commitment, uh, it is about purpose and articulation in the form of to present the truth as a personal conviction. If we are going to look to the mechanism, it's fully committed to the truth articulated, not merely offering a superficial uh, statement. And the range of outcomes uh, is about integrity and personal risk. So personal risk, very important. Risk bearing, uh, if we're going to look to the purpose, is to face the potential dangers and consequences of speaking the truth. Then the mechanisms bearing personal risks again, including risking relationships, jobs, and life. And life is from the ancient research, but uh, you can imagine the, the risks are high. The range of outcomes here are courage and potential backlash. Then if we are going to look to the ethical guidance, we see in purpose and articulation to help individuals see their actual situation, character, and shortcomings. Uh, mechanisms, we see revealing what people hide from themselves. So again, reflection, again the link with the halo. And the range of outcomes is about self-awareness and ethical clarity. Well, we have one question. What is then the impact of disability on own disability ethics? Well, if we're going to look to truth telling, it is uh, that it encourages transparency about accessibility needs and challenges, promoting a more inclusive environment. If we look to commitment, uh, the impact fosters a culture of authenticity and integrity, ensuring that individuals with disabilities can openly discuss their experiences without fear. If we're going to look to risk bearing, uh, it is about highlight uh, the bravery required for individuals to, uh, with disabilities to speak up 
about discrimination leading to systematic changes. And uh, the last one, ethical guidance. It promotes ethical awareness and understanding among organizational members, aiding in the recognition and correction of ableist attitudes and practices. So in ancient times, there was one person, he and she, that has the perfect solutions to be a parhesiast. And that was the court jester. Uh, but the court jester, I think you all know the court jester as that funny guy of medieval times that making jokes and making fun of and with the king. But he had 15 other roles, so in total 16 roles at the court of the king uh, to prevent the king from halo uh, disasters, for example. Um, only in 1789, the court jester has disappeared and never come back. And that is uh, in my second research, so the comeback of the court jester Hofnar of Buffone della Corte. Thank you very much. If you have uh, questions, I think we are almost out of time now, but we will be happy to answer one or two questions. And otherwise, you can email us uh, to the Dutch uh, email addresses. Any questions? Oh. Is that applause? Yes. Sir. Nice. No questions? Uh, yeah? Uh, no, thanks, Simon, and good to see you in real life, um, not just on the screen. Um, I don't look at the efficacy of whistleblowing directly and specifically, but uh, in some of the interviews it has come up where people have activated the whistleblowing mechanisms and have almost been encouraged to leave the organization because the organization believes that protecting the organization is in their better interest than um, dealing with the case. And I think we can maybe explain that through the sense of moral justification, that if we divert our resources into investigating this case activated through whistleblowing, it will detract from the mission. So it's rather like, thank you for your concern, but since you're concerned, please, please leave. So there were several interviews that did talk about the absolute frustration of uh, formal governance structure, but in, in real life, the implementation not, not working. Yes. Just, just a very quick comment. How do you think your work fits with what's generally called service leadership? I mean, service leadership that follows the need and, and, and you know, like I said, prioritizing the other and service and so on. Do you think uh, we can learn something from this kind of thing, service leadership? Yeah. I think uh, this is more like uh, you have servant leadership, personal leadership, all kinds of leadership concepts and all talking about the leadership uh, style, but I think my research is more on the content, so it's more like, how do you call it? Truth-based leadership. So not only the, the side of the leader, but, but where is the leading? Uh, where uh, uh, does the leader um, receive his information from? So it's more like truth-based leadership and not that popular uh, names, excusez-moi, uh, for leadership styles. Yeah, it depends on the definition of... Uh, it, it does. I think prioritization of the other is crucial. Yeah, a great one. Yeah, agree. But Thanks. I think that can also be a risk for the halo, because okay. if there is this perception that one is sacrificing oneself for the other, there can be that tendency to think that that servant leader is good, inherently good, uh, and by definition, believe, trust that that person is, is good. 
so that that sense of moral naivete can be uh, also enabled. So if that servant leader were to behave counter to expectations, people would rather be cognitive dissonance about it and ignore that than actually uh, consider the implications of, of that. So. Yeah, let's connect. Uh, it, is, it is very funny, what should you do is, I think it is just do it. It is the tagline of, uh, of Nike. Sometimes, uh, most of the times we, we actually know what to do, but we don't do it. I think there's a threshold, seriously there, to just do it. There are different kind of things that you can do. Um, yeah, it is. Do you want to react from your research from it? Or? Yes, uh, and maybe uh, this is a frustrating answer, but since it's an <laughs> academic conference, I will say that is what we are doing research on. Uh, but specifically, you know, if we were to consider this halo effect as inherent to this type of organization, morally good organization, I think it would be very interesting to look also at what kind of inherent ethics framework should we be considering? Because at the moment, when we're talking about safeguarding policies and trainings and whistleblowing and, and focal people, we are borrowing this from the, the business ethics side. So the business ethics side has been researching this, talking about this for decades. Um, in our sector, it's much newer. And that also begs the question, why is it much newer? Because I think there is still that sense of that goodness that we don't need it, to what Nandini also said earlier, right? We are small, we don't need it, we are inherently good. So in terms of what we, are, we should be doing, I think we are doing what we are learning from business ethics, but we are seeing that it's not enough. So I, I, I'm starting to research of how can we think about our own ethics based on what inherently drives our unethicality. This, this halo. I know it's a very frustrating uh, answer, but maybe next year I can, we can be more specific. And from the practical side, you can, you can organize it in, in organizations. You can give someone the license to speak. Uh, for example, the, the heads, the thinking heads of the Bono, uh, when you are the black head, you, you can be very negative about things. Uh, and they give you applause. When you normally be very negative about things, then you are, uh, here's that neg negativity guy or girl again. But that license to speak is very important, or because license to speak is in the organizations, or you can hire a court jester. And then it's outside on the inside without interests. Yeah, so if you are looking for a, a, a plan, then hire a court jester. Yeah. Okay, this is an ethics is a time sharing. Um, I just want to let you know um, kind of related to the halo effect. There was a book that's just been um, released with the story of the Christian Jan Club, I don't know her name. Cool. And one of the contributing authors and who did this. But so a number of theologians that worked with Vanya were very much engaging with Vanya's work. I was one that was critical of his language, but anyway, writing about Thank you. 
So thank you very much for your debate-provoking uh, presentation. Uh, we have now a coffee break of half an hour, uh, and then we go to the Ask the Expert or Reflection Groups. And you all know what group to go to. And then we come back uh, at 5 o'clock here in the Aula Magna. So hope to see you in the end, and have a good coffee break. Thank you.